been told it all along in the storybooks and in the songs. If I follow my heart, it will make me strong. But Lord, you've told me differently. My heart alone beats selfishly. The only way it will lead true is if my heart belongs to you. Just believe that won't make it right. I'll only know which path to take. I'll only know which choice to make if my heart belongs to you. Happy Sabbath. We are so happy that you decided to spend your Sabbath with us. 
Before we begin, I kindly ask that you grab a Bible. We'll go through a few texts, but please grab your Bible as we will study the Word of God this morning. Second request, that you pray within your heart for the Holy Spirit to speak to you directly. We're asking, number one, for the Holy Spirit to give us a hatred for sin and a love for righteousness. And number two, uh, also ask the Holy Spirit to touch some family member or a friend or someone who has strayed or backslidden from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because Jesus desires that all men and women to be saved. So we're asking for the Holy Spirit, and we're asking for a hatred for sin and a love for righteousness. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we ask that the Holy Spirit will speak through the word as we learn together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, growing up as a child, as children are, if you have children, you know that children can be disobedient at times. You tell them to do this, and they do not do it. You tell them, do not go here, and they go. Well, before I entered high school in the 90s, my mother, we grew up in a single mother home. Three, she raised three men on her own. She went to work and she told us, do not go outside until I come home. And so as boys, as soon as she left, we went outside. We did not obey her wishes, although what she said was for our good. And we had a friend who lived across the street and we decided to play a BB gun fight. Now, I don't know if you have a, know what a BB gun is, but it's not a real gun. It has small stainless steel uh, pellets or bullets. And so I had my BB gun, he had his BB gun, and we decided to play this game of, of shooting each other, you can say. <laughs> it was very silly. We would hide behind the corner of the house or hide in bushes. And if I saw my friend, I'll take my BB gun and I'll shoot at him. And whoever was hit first was the loser. I remember this day, I was coming uh, across a pathway and he was uh, quite a distance away from me. And as I turned the pathway, he was right before me, a little in the distance, and he had his gun, and he shot it. And when my friend shot the BB gun, I ducked. And as I ducked, the BB, it hit my forehead. Now, this happened, I believe, 1993. It was either 92 or 93. And when the BB hit, the blood started pouring. My friend, he grabbed his shirt and he put it over my eye as the blood was pouring forth. And, you know, that, that event, being shot with a BB, never would have occurred if I was obedient to my mother. And till this day, if you take your finger, if you are here in this studio, and you took your finger and you went across my eyebrow, you will still feel the BB. It is still lodged in my eyebrow. It is still there since 1993. Why? A result of disobedience. And much blood was shed that day. Brothers and sisters, disobedience 
is never for our benefit. When we disobey God, we are in trouble. And as that blood flowed, I want to ask you a question. When is blood first hinted at in the Bible? Where's the first hint of blood? We know the word is first used in Genesis chapter 4, the story of Cain and Abel. But when is blood first hinted at in the scriptures? Well, grab your Bible and let us turn to Genesis chapter 3. Let us turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And of course, this is the first promise of salvation in the entire Bible. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. We're answering the question, where is blood first hinted at in the Bible? Well, let's look at the first promise of salvation first. The Bible reads in verse 15, God speaking, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And of course, God is addressing the serpent or Satan. So we have the first promise of salvation. Now skip down to verse 21. Verse 21 reads, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. This is absolutely fascinating. The Bible says you have coats of skin. God did not cover Adam and Eve with linen and cotton. No, he covered them with leather. Now, we do know that leather comes from an animal. So we do know that an animal was killed in that garden. So here we have the first hint of blood being shed is found in the Garden of Eden. So from the very beginning of the Bible, from the very beginning, when sin takes place, you have the shedding of blood. Now, let's keep in mind, we have the promise of salvation in verse 15. You have the promise for first. And then after the promise in verse 21, we just read it, that blood is shed. So you have the promise of salvation and you have the shedding of blood. The Bible is teaching us that from the beginning, salvation and blood, they go together. There is no salvation absent of the blood. Now, question. Does the theme of blood and salvation continue throughout the entire Bible? That's a good question. Does that theme of blood and salvation continue from Genesis all the way to Revelation? Let's turn to Revelation. Now, of course, we, don't, we do know the Israelites. They have the sanctuary and the shedding of anim, the blood of animals, etc. in Exodus, Leviticus, so forth and so on. And in Revelation chapter 1, the Bible reads, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own what? Blood. So the theme is consistent. From Genesis chapter 3 to Exodus, the sanctuary service, Leviticus, all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament, and in the last book of the Bible, we have here in Revelation 1 verse 5, uh, us being washed from our sins by the blood. So this theme, follow me very carefully, this theme of blood, and salvation, again, they go together. There is no salvation absent of the blood. 
That's very clear. So I'll ask some more questions so, so we're together. Is blood necessary for your salvation? And the answer is yes. Is the blood of Jesus Christ significant? The answer is yes. Are you thankful for the blood of Jesus? And the answer is yes. Does your blood have power? The answer is no. Brothers and sisters, we are saved by the blood of Jesus. Now let's go a little deeper in our Bible study. Let's turn now to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 5. Leviticus chapter 5. So we laid the foundation that salvation is not absent of the blood. You need both salvation and blood. They go together. That theme is consistent from Genesis to Revelation. Now, Leviticus chapter 5, very interesting. We'll begin in verse 1. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 1. The Bible reads, And if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing and is a witness, whether he have seen or known of it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. Or if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast, or a carcass of an unclean cattle, or the carcass of unclean creeping things, and if it be hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. Or if he touch the uncleanness of man, whatsoever uncleanness it be that a man shall be defiled with all, and it be hid from him when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty. Or if a soul swear, pronouncing from his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he have sinned in that thing. So it is very clear the context so far of Leviticus chapter 5, it is addressing sin and sacrifices. Okay, we do not know that Leviticus is heavy in the, the sacrificial system, the day of atonement, etc. So, so Moses, he goes through all what we have just read uh, in verses 1 to 5. Now listen to what he says in verse 6. And he shall bring, this is the sinner, and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin which he hath sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats, for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. Now focus on verse 7 very carefully. And it reads, And if he be not able, meaning if he cannot afford, if he cannot afford to bring a lamb, then he shall bring for his trespass which he hath committed two turtle doves or two young pigeons unto the Lord, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. Let's pause right here. This is absolutely fascinating. God gives instructions to Moses of the sacrificial system and these animals and it gives detail, and the Bible just told us that these animals, it, you acquired these animals for a price. You had to pay for them. It was not free. So the Bible says again in verse 7, and if he be not able to bring a lamb, if you could not afford a lamb, Though maybe you can afford a couple of pigeons or turtle doves. You can afford some birds. You know, I like illustration. Illustrations can 
make the point a little clearer. Let's say I am living, I am living during this time. I'm, doing, I'm living during the time of Moses, and I commit a sin. And I know that I have to go, I have to purchase a lamb, the most common sacrifice, to atone for my sin. And I go to the shop in Jerusalem, and I'm there, I'm not the door, and a man opens the door. And I say to this gentleman, you know, I need to purchase a lamb. I committed a sin. And the man tells me, okay, well, a lamb, a spotless lamb is going to cost $20. But I only have $1 to my name. And he responds to me, well, I cannot help you. And I say, okay, sir, well, I hear that if I cannot afford the lamb, that I can buy turtle doves or some pigeons. How much are the birds? And the owner of the shop would respond to me and says, well, the birds, they are $5 each. Well, sir, I only have a dollar. I cannot afford the lamb, and I cannot afford the turtle doves or the pigeons, but I need to be forgiven. And since I cannot afford the lamb or the pigeons or the turtle doves, maybe I will turn my back and leave his shop, and now I am sad. But I praise God that God made a provision for those who could not afford to purchase a lamb or a couple of birds. What was that provision? I'm glad you asked. Skip now to verse 11. Go to verse 11. This is, I love this. Verse 11 in Leviticus chapter 5 reads, But if he be not able or cannot afford to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he that sinned shall bring for his offering the tenth part of an ephah. That's approximately two quarts of fine flour for a sin offering. He shall put no oil upon it, neither shall he put any frankincense thereon, for it is a sin offering. Wow. So so let's go back to our illustration. I'm at the shop. I cannot afford a lamb. I cannot afford two turtle doves or two pigeons. And now I am sad. But the cashier or the owner of the store says to me, but you know what? God has made a provision that you can use flour as your sin offering. Okay, well, how much is that flour, sir? Well, the flour will only cost you 50 cents. Praise God, I can afford that. And I'll receive 50 cents back. (laughs) The illustration is clear. God made provision so that every single person in Israel could have forgiveness. They could experience forgiveness. It did not matter if you were wealthy, super rich, or if you were homeless. Every single person could be forgiven. You know, last summer, I traveled with a group from my church. We traveled to the Philippines. We were there for three weeks absolutely powerful experience. Uh, We did evangelism, revivals. We also did uh, medical missionary work. Well, while we were there, we traveled by boat for about an hour to an island called Talikud. And there at Talikud, this beautiful island, we had our revival series, and medical outreach. And I'll never forget one day, we went to a small town and we had slippers for the children. 
And here you can see on the screen all of the children, they're waiting to receive their slippers. We had a devotional first. We said a few words about Jesus and we prayed for the children and their parents and the community. And we finally distributed the slippers to the kids. You see the picture on the screen. And these children, they were so excited to receive these slippers, something that we take for granted. You know, in America, if someone were to give you slippers, I'm not sure. I don't think you would be too excited. If someone said, hey, Alvin, I want to give you a wonderful gift. I'm going to give you some slippers. I, I don't think that that is something we take for granted. If we receive slippers in America, it better have a little horse on it, <laughs> a polo or a Gucci, a designer. We take things very, very for granted. And those kids in that very, very poor island, they were ecstatic, excited to receive slippers. The point is, the most wealthy in the Philippines, let's say in Manila, the most wealthy in the Philippines in Manila, all the way down to the poor of the poor in Talikud, during the time of Moses, every single one of them could experience God's forgiveness. God made a provision, I'm repeating myself for emphasis, for the wealthy to the poor, everyone can be forgiven. Now, with that said, a lesser sacrifice like flour, I will say this. If you were living during the time of Moses and you brought flour as your sacrifice for a sin, but you could afford a lamb, but you decided, you know what? I will save some money, I will save some cash, and I will bring a flower, it will be accepted. No, that flower would not be accepted before God because God knows the heart and God knows that you could afford to purchase a lamb. Brothers and sisters, this is amazing. God knows my heart and he knows your heart. But as I'm studying the Bible, I have a problem. And the problem is this. Let's say, for example, I have a sack of flour on this podium, and I start beating this sack of flour. No matter how many times I beat the sack of flour, would, would it ever, will it ever produce blood? The answer, of course, is no. You can beat it and beat it and beat it, but blood is never produced. But flour was accepted by God. This is a conundrum. Because, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning of our Bible study, Salvation, there is no salvation absent of the blood. We saw that from Genesis 3 all the way to Revelation chapter 1. Blood, forgiveness, blood, salvation, they go together. But now we have flour. That's interesting. Flour being accepted by God as a sin offering? Hmm. Why is this the case? Well, let's think about it. In the sanctuary service, the animals that were sacrificed pointed to whom? And I can almost hear you saying, Christ, and you are correct. All the animals, the lambs, the bulls, and the rams, the goats, they pointed to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he shed his blood so that we could be saved. So if all of the animals during the sanctuary service, if they all pointed to Christ, 
And flour, according to Leviticus, was accepted by God as a sin offering. That then means that the flour also points to Jesus Christ. Hmm. That's interesting. Now, someone might be saying as you're watching this, well, how does flour point to Jesus? I love this. During that time, we must ask ourselves the question, how was flour made? Have you ever seen a picture of a millstone? Maybe you have. Of course, there are two large stones and there's a handle attached to the top stone. And you would put the wheat grain or the, the, the seed in between the millstone, in between the two stones, and you will grab the handle and you would turn that handle and it would crush the grain or the seed of the wheat. And as a result of crushing that seed, you now have flour. So let's think about this. That seed that was crushed or that grain that was crushed to produce the flour, we must ask ourselves the question, was Jesus Christ, was he crushed for our sins? Well, let's turn to Isaiah. Let's turn to the book of Isaiah to answer this question. Was Jesus crushed for our sins? Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. Isaiah 53, verse 10. The Bible reads, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. The word there means crush. To bruise or crush him, that's Jesus. He hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The Bible is very clear that Jesus Christ, it was prophesied that he would be crushed for our sins. Now, praise God for that. Because if it were not for Jesus, we would all be lost. So the Bible clearly tells us, as the wheat grain was crushed, so was Jesus. Well, let's look at another text. Because we're trying to figure out, how does flower point to Jesus Christ? Well, flower, I'm going to ask you a question. This is not a trick question, just a, just a question. How... Is bread made? What do you use to make bread? Do you use fish? No. Do you use an animal? No. Bread is made by flour. Hmm, that's interesting. So we must ask ourselves then again, does the flour point to Jesus? Let's take our Bibles and turn to John chapter 6. Let's turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 35. John chapter 6, verse 35, and this is Jesus speaking. Listen to this verse. Verse 35 reads, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Pause. This is very clear. The Bible clearly tells us Jesus is speaking and Jesus says that bread, I am the bread of life, referring to eternal life. You eat from Christ, you live forever. Here we have Jesus clearly saying that the bread points to him. Brothers and sisters, the Bible is clear. In Isaiah chapter 53, Jesus was crushed as the wheat grain is crushed to produce flour. Jesus just told us in John chapter 6 that he is the bread of life and bread is made with flour. So, of course, the flour, it points to Jesus. As the lamb, bulls, and rams pointed to Christ, so does the flour. 
Hmm. But the Bible tells us there's still a problem. Because the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, please turn there. Hebrews chapter 9, there's still a problem. I see that the, the bread points to Christ, the flour points to Christ, but there's still a problem. Because in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, a very familiar text, the Bible reads, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Wow. Wait a minute. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or no forgiveness for sins. I'm in trouble because, as I stated earlier, <laughs> you can pound flour all day long and it will never, ever, ever produce one drop of blood. And I need that blood to have my sins forgiven. You need that blood to be forgiven. Remember, <laughs> salvation is not absent from the blood. So how do we put this together? How do we make sense of flour being a sacrifice for sin? Where is the blood? Let's turn back now to our last text in Leviticus chapter 5. Let's go back to Leviticus chapter 5. Our last text, Leviticus chapter 5. And we'll, we will read verse 11 once more. We'll, we will read 11 and 12 for context, okay? Leviticus chapter 5, verse 11. But if he be not able or cannot afford to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he that have sinned shall bring for his offering the tenth part of an ephah of fine flour, for a sin offering. He shall put no oil upon it, neither shall he put any frankincense thereon, for it is a sin offering. Now listen to verse 12 very carefully. Then shall he bring it to the priest, referring to the flower. And the priest shall take his handful of it even a memorial thereof, and burn it on the altar. Do not miss this. Burn it on the altar according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. It is a sin offering. Wow. My Bible is closed. This is absolutely mind-blowing. Let me repeat, repeat for emphasis. You know, repetition deepens the impression. It is good to repeat so we're all together as we study the Bible. Again, flour does not produce blood. But the Bible tells us how this, this was to be done. The sinner would give the flour to the priest the priest would then take that flower and place the flower on the altar of burnt sacrifice. Now, let's just use our imagination. Let's say I am at the sanctuary and this pulpit, this podium here, represents the altar of burnt offering, the altar of sacrifice, where you had... Uh, lambs being slain, okay? And the priest, he would take that flower and he would place it on the altar of burnt sacrifice so the flower could be consumed. Now, why is this fascinating? Because although flour does not produce blood, the blood of animals... Oh, listen to me very carefully. This is powerful. The blood of 
animals were still on that altar of sacrifice. There was still blood there. So get the picture. Every time that priest would take that flower and cast it on the altar, the flower always came in contact with blood. Wow. Always. And if there was, if there was fresh blood on the altar of sacrifice, if the blood was fresh, and the priest takes the flower and he casts the flower on the fresh blood, what would that flower do to the blood? <laughs> yes, it would soak up the blood. Brothers and sisters, the flower would be covered by the blood. And this is why. Because nowhere is it written in the Bible that flour will make atonement for sin and that the life is in the flour. No, the life is in the blood. Brothers and sisters, the good news this morning is God made provision for the poorest to experience salvation. And whenever you brought that flower, whenever that poor individual brought the flower, it always came in contact with the blood. And this is why that flower was accepted by God as a sacrifice. It pointed to Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. And it always came in contact with blood. Brothers and sisters, the blood of Jesus is available for every single person watching this program. Every single one of you can be saved eternally. I want to make an appeal, and my appeal is very simple. The first appeal is, if you have never been baptized, talk to your pastor as soon as possible and get baptized. Why put it off? Get baptized. Number two, if you have backslidden, if you have strayed from Jesus, the good news is you can come back to Jesus right now. You do not have to wait for the next sermon or the next program or the next Bible study. You can come to Jesus now. That's the second appeal. My third appeal, if you are holding on to unforgiveness towards someone else, someone wronged you 5, 10, 15 years ago, and you're still holding on to a grudge, the Bible teaches that God cannot forgive you. He cannot forgive me if I do not forgive someone who wronged me. So that, that is the third appeal. You, you, the, it blows the mind of how many people hold an anger and bitterness towards someone else who attends their church. You can be in Sabbath school with someone you hate. Brothers and sisters, this is not Christianity. So the third appeal is, if you're holding on to unforgiveness, the Holy Ghost is chasing you to forgive the person who has wronged you. Make things right, and God is going to bless. I'm going to pray. As I pray, you pray within your heart. And the prayer is this. We are being very honest with God. God, I can't stand this brother or this sister. I don't like them. Be honest. God, I have a sin in my life and I like it. This is not a struggle. I like this sin, but Lord, I need victory. I need the power of the Holy Spirit to have victory over this vice or this addiction or sin in my life. We're going to be honest. Lord, I have backslidden and I am coming back to you 
today. The good news is Jesus has his arms open wide and he will accept you as his child. So let us pray and let us be very, very honest with God. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this time spent in the word. We thank you for the Bible that is so powerful. I pray for all three appeals. Someone needs to be baptized, that they will get baptized as soon as possible. Why wait? Lord, I pray for the one who has backslidden, that they will come back to Christ today. I pray for the one who is holding onto unforgiveness towards someone else, that they will pick up the phone if they have to. Forgive that person who has wronged them. And Lord, whatever sin that we may be holding on to, it's not a struggle. We like it. Lord, we have to give it up by the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh God, empower your children to gain victory over sin. And Lord, give us a hatred for iniquity and a love for righteousness. I pray a blessing on this ministry, Secrets Unsealed. Bless the leadership, bless the staff, and may we all hold on to Jesus for dear life as we're living in these last days. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Thank you.